morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Friends Life Care Wellness Webinar on Tax Reduction Strategies for Pennsylvania Inheritance Tax, presented by the State Attorney Nigo Pyle. My name is Gail Tamarcio, and I'm the Friends Life Care Director of Wellness Initiatives, and I am delighted that you're joining us today. I'll be moderating today's session, and before we begin, I'm just going to give you a few housekeeping tips so you know exactly um, how to participate for it. So if you look on your um, screen on the top right, you should see a box that looks like the box that the arrow is pointing to here, and this is the attendee interface. And so you are now listening in on your computer. Um, if you don't have a good connection and you'd like to call in on your phone, you can just click the telephone box and a phone number will appear for you to call. And um, we have, you're going to have the opportunity today to submit questions to Nigo uh, as, you, as he's doing his presentation, and he'll answer them at the proper time. But you'll see a box that says questions, so all you have to do is just type your question in there and hit enter, and we'll see your question, and Nigo will answer it for you. So we encourage you to ask any questions that you have. We want to be sure that all your questions are answered. Um, and Nigo may also ask you to participate by raising your hand. And to do so, you're going to click on the yellow hand that's directly to the left of the question box. You'll see it here on the screen. Um, at the very bottom of the small bar, the vertical bar that's to the left of the question box, the yellow palm with the green arrow on it. So you just click that, and then um, we will see your response here. Okay, so um, now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Nigo Pyle. Uh, Nigo is an attorney with the Pyle Law Firm and practices in the areas of elder law, estate planning, administration, guardianship, special needs planning, business law, and real estate. Nico is also responsible for all guardianship cases with Intervention Associates, which is a nonprofit sister company of Friends Life Care, which provides care management and guardianship services. So, Nico, you're a very busy guy. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Gail. And let me just start off by saying I, I know you're looking at the first page that says Tax Reduction Strategies for Pennsylvania Inheritance Tax. Just note that the picture on that on that page, I look a whole lot younger than in that picture. Um, but no, I, I really want to thank everyone for participating in today's uh, call. And as Gail mentioned, I'm an estate planning attorney. And, you know, one of the questions that my clients ask me after, you know, they try to inquire about ways to protect their assets and to protect their family is how do I reduce the amount of taxes that I have to pay to the state, and in some cases to the federal government. So that's the subject of today's discussion, and we're going to just explore different strategies on how to reduce the uh, taxes that you would have to pay or your estate would have to pay on the Pennsylvania inheritance taxes. So. In Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is one of the states that still has its own inheritance taxes or what they commonly call death taxes. And so the property that's included in your estate that will be taxed are the items listed on the page that you're seeing right now. So that will include real estate. So the property or the real estate that you own right now, that's going to be subject to inheritance taxes. Any investments that you have, whether it's uh, securities, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, uh, cash in your bank accounts, those are going to be subject to inheritance taxes as well. And also retirement accounts, certain retirement accounts, and that's if uh, you're over 59 and a half years old. And we'll get into retirement accounts and and some of the planning objectives that you can employ to address potential tax issues. And a lot of you that are married, you have property, real estate that you own jointly with someone, uh, and if you're married, preferably your spouse. And in Pennsylvania, that's uh, based on the percentage of, uh, actually, it's, it's based on that percentage that you own. Um, so if you own 50% of that property uh, and it's not going to your spouse, 
that's going to be included. If it's going to your spouse, it's going to be tax-free. So some of the property that's excluded from Pennsylvania inheritance taxes would include life insurance, uh, again, jointly held property with your spouse, and retirement accounts if you're under 59 and a half years old. I want you to keep in mind these three areas that are excluded from the Pennsylvania inheritance taxes because we'll talk about those different exclusions throughout the discussion today. So it's important to know what the tax rates are in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and so um, for all purposes, I'm going to focus on Pennsylvania inheritance taxes on my discussion today. And just for information purposes, with the new tax law that was enacted uh, under President Trump, the uh, federal exclusion for taxes, meaning the amount of money that you can have that would not be taxable um, on the federal level, would be $11,180,000 per individual. <clears throat> so if you're married, just double that. And so if my math is right, it would be $22,360,000. Uh, for a married couple, and and so a large part of the population falls under that threshold. So a lot of the estate exclusions on the federal level will apply. <clears throat> and so what we really have to look at is the Pennsylvania inheritance taxes that you would be subject to. And so on this slide, you can see uh, the different uh, tax rates for, I'm sorry, I, I just realized that I said 22,000 instead of 22 million. That's 22,360,000 um, on the federal level that a joint couple, married couple, would be able to exclude. So on Pennsylvania inheritance taxes, uh, between spouses, there's no tax, and that would be a 0% taxable event to property that's transferred between husband and wife. Property that's transferred to a child, a grandchild, um, to a parent, that would be 4.5% of the total value that's distributed to that particular beneficiary. And property that's distributed to a brother or sister would be at a 12% tax rate. And those of you who want to leave money to your friends and you're generous like that, it's going to be 15%. And so, uh, you know, that's something to, to think about. And also for charities, you're going to be at a 0% tax rate because uh, the charities are tax exempt organizations. So that would also include nonprofit organizations as well. So looking at uh, life insurance, and we'll talk about the differences with the federal and the state rules. And keep in mind, you know, what I mentioned in terms of the uh, $11,180,000 exclusion per individual on the federal level. But on the, for life insurance, um, as I mentioned, Pennsylvania is not going to tax that life insurance on the inheritance taxes, but if you do have assets greater than that $11,180,000 or for married couples, $22,360,000, that will be taxed on the federal level. And so there's certain estate planning techniques and procedures we would need to do to make sure that we could minimize the tax on the federal level. For the marital deduction, um, what we really have to, to keep in mind is the impact that the second spouse, meaning after the first spouse passes away and leaves money to the second spouse, uh, that money is not going to be taxed to the spouse that's receiving it. But when that second spouse passes away, 
the money that that second spouse leaves to a beneficiary will be taxed based on the beneficiary that the money is being distributed to. Um, if you just go back to the previous slide and look at the tax rates per uh, beneficiary in that particular uh, line. And with uh, Pennsylvania, there's an exclusion or, um, you know, if it's joint property held between spouses, there's not going to be taxes. Obviously, if it's held by non-spouses, the percentage of interest that the person who passed away. So if the person who passed away has a 50% interest in a property, 50% of that property will be taxed um, on uh, Pennsylvania inheritance taxes. And that's for property that's held between two people who are not married. Um, so if we look at some planning techniques for individuals with joint accounts, um, joint ownership of assets is, is one of the simplest uh, things that can have a big impact on the Pennsylvania inheritance tax liability. Percentage of ownership rules uh, allow for reducing the Pennsylvania inheritance taxes through the use of joint ownership. So think of bank accounts, think of real property, think of any property that you may own that you want to hold jointly with someone else. And in this scenario, let's say you own a property jointly with uh, your child. So a parent and the child jointly own the house. And let's say the house is worth $400,000. Uh, if the parent wanted to leave that house to the child and did so in a will, you would multiply that 4.5% by the $400,000, and that would get you, I believe that would be $18,000 in inheritance taxes that you would have to pay. Now, if the parent and the child own the property jointly, and the parent has a 50% interest in that property, meaning that that $400,000 property would be valued at $200,000, multiplying that by 4.5% means that the inheritance taxes would be $9,000 or half of what it would be in a situation where the parent left the entire property to the child in their will. So we have a question. Are you saying that 10 that the federal exclusion of $11 million per person also applies in Pennsylvania? No, it does not. <clears throat> uh, what, there are two things that you have to, to really look at. Um, there's the federal level and then there's the state level. In Pennsylvania, there isn't that exclusion level that you have in the federal level. So in Pennsylvania, irregardless of the value of the estate, the emphasis is more so on who's getting the money. So the beneficiary, the, the state is, the Department of Revenue for Pennsylvania is going to look at the beneficiary. And so if the beneficiary is your child. If you have $100,000 that you're leaving to that child, they're going to tax it at the 4.5% interest rate. And so there isn't that equivalent exclusion that you would have on the federal level, on the state level. So someone just asked the question whether there is any exclusion. So for small estates, and we're talking about estates less than $25,000, they, there, there would be, there wouldn't be an exclusion, but there is an opportunity to uh, resolve or close the estate of estates that are less than $25,000 in a much quicker fashion. But if you left that $25,000 to your child, that $25,000 would be taxed at the 4.5% interest rate. So we have a comment that says, also joint bank and brokerage accounts with children would reduce PA tax. That's 
uh, as part of that discussion that I was just uh, having with regard to the house. So if you apply that discussion to a joint bank account um, or any joint account, the same principle would apply. And, and, and that's, uh, that's a correct uh, comment. So you would be able to reduce that taxable event. So in the scenario I just mentioned, we reduced the taxable impact to the estate by $9,000 or half by having a joint owner, having the son or the daughter as a joint owner with mom or dad. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that if the transfer of property is made within less than a year of death, date of death, uh, there, that amount that's transferred to the beneficiary would come back into the estate and be taxed at the per, uh, particular interest rate that that beneficiary is in. So if uh, $100,000 was distributed uh, to uh, a beneficiary on December 31st, 2017, and or let's say $103,000 was uh, distributed to a beneficiary in December 2017, and the parent passes away in June, First of 2018, that $103,000 would be subject to coming back into the estate and would be taxable uh, on that 4.5%. Now, there is an exclusion of $3,000 for transfers made less than one year prior to the death of the decedent. So, of that $103,000, $3,000 would be able to be excluded, and the $100,000 that uh, that person distributed to the beneficiary would be subject to the 4.5% interest uh, going to the child. And we have a question, what is the tax implication at time of transfer of property? So at the time of the transfer of the property, so let's say that uh, the parent transfers uh, $100,000 to the child. We have to be aware and cognizant of the limits that can be made in any given year um, for a gift to any beneficiary while you're living. While you're alive, you're able to give $15,000 uh, tax-free to an individual. And that doesn't have to be a family, it can be anyone. And so if you're married, the husband can give 15000 to the son, uh, the wife can give another $15,000 to the son, and that son would be able to take $30,000 in any, any one given year. If you give more than that, and in the scenario I just mentioned, you give $100,000 to that child, the tax implication, you would have to file uh, paperwork with the Department of Revenue indicating that you've given a gift in excess of the $15,000 for grantor. Um, and so in this scenario, you would file paperwork with the Department of Revenue stating that $70,000 of that $100,000 would be subject to gift taxes. And that would be at the rate uh, of 4.5% uh, on $70,000 for that child. So, Convenience, uh, all right, we have a question, example, 50% of house estimated at $400,000 more than a year before passing. Um, so if you put somebody on the deed uh, 
and the house is valued at $400,000 at the date of death. And that person was put on the property more than a year before you passed away. The only amount that would be subject to inheritance taxes would be the $200,000, which represents the parent's interest. Because that uh, transfer was made more than a year prior to the death. So the only uh, impact would be on the $200,000 that is the parent's interest. And that would be taxed at the 4.5% uh, interest. So looking at convenience accounts, convenience accounts, again, are primarily joint accounts. And you know, so when you think of those accounts, the, the, uh, the, the purpose or the reason that that account is being set up is important. So if the account was made joint for the primary purpose of giving the child the ability <clears throat> to access the account to pay the parent's bills, it will be taxed at the 100% level because what that child is doing, that child is helping the parent pay the bill and the child is not taking an ownership interest in the property. But if the parent does make a gift to the child and allows the child to uh, get 50% of the value of the property in that real estate, then, and that's done a year or more prior to death, then that amount that is subject to the inheritance taxes would be 50% of that account. So it's important that at the time that you're putting a child or someone else on that account, that you put some notes together indicating what the purpose of that child going on the account is for. And if it is to give them a gift, then you want to indicate to in the notes that you are making a gift to that child and the child is a true joint owner of that account. And obviously, if it's for the purpose of assisting you with paying bills, and commonly we'll see that with power attorneys, where the parent will provide uh, uh, the agent, the child, the authority to make financial decisions and planning for the parents. That would be uh, the situation where the child is merely helping the parent pay bills and 100% of that parent's bank account value would be subject to the inheritance taxes. So I have a question, what does my child pay at time of transfer? Okay, so that's pertaining to the house. So at time of transfer, um, if you're asking uh, if they're going to purchase the property and, and actually pay uh, value for the property, that's something different than uh, gifting the property or an interest in the property to the child. If they are paying for the property and, and they're taking ownership of it, the gift rules would not apply and the child would pay 50% of the value of the market value of the house. So if the house at the time you're making the transfer is valued at $400,000 and the child is going to pay for it, that is a uh, quid pro quo uh, transaction, and that child is going to pay the $200,000. Oh, as I mentioned before, if it's a gift, then the the your uh, the child and it's uh, and, and the death occurs more than a year after the gift. The child will uh, inherit uh, your 50% and the estate would pay 4.5%. But keep in mind the $15,000 limit per donee um, that each, uh, each parent can give to the child. All right, you got it. So what are the rules if wife dies without a will and has grown children? So if wife dies without a will and has grown children, the intestate rules, meaning the statutory rules of Pennsylvania would apply. And the order in which the child receives property would 
uh, it, it would fall in line of spouse, in order of spouse, child, parent, sibling, sibling of the decedent, and then it goes on to other parties. So the statutory provision in Pennsylvania would kick in. And so if you have a will, you have the ability to change that because if you feel that your child should not receive the uh, your assets or your property because they're going to mismanage it or they are not going to be good stewards, then you may want to identify someone else who could uh, be that beneficiary. And, and that's one of the important reasons to draft a will or a trust. Uh, another question, are you saying $15,000? It is not clear. So yeah, $15,000 is the state of Pennsylvania or the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, well, not only Commonwealth, I'm sorry, on the federal level for all states, it's $50,000 that you can gift anyone in any one year. So each parent can gift a child or any one individual $15,000 without incurring a tax, a taxable event. All right, so using the uh, power of attorney. Uh, the power of attorney, if you create, if someone, if you create a power of attorney and you want to make gifting uh, a power that your agent has, it has to be specifically spelled out in the power of attorney, especially under the new power of attorney laws. If it's not spelled out, that individual, your agent, if you become incapacitated, would not be able to make gifts on your behalf. And also, if uh, you want them to change title to property, that has to be specifically spelled out or they are not going to be able to make those changes to your property. So it's important that when you're filling out or preparing these documents, you really consider those things. And it's also helpful to talk to an attorney just to make sure that everything that you're looking to accomplish, that it can be accomplished. We have a question, how much can an executor charge for doing an estate? So an executor can charge, uh, it, it depends on how much is in the estate. If there's, let's say $200,000 in the estate, Pennsylvania courts have been comfortable with the executor charging 3% uh, of that estate value. If it's a million dollars, uh, the courts have been uh, a little bit more open to between 1% and 2% of that estate value. So as the value goes higher, the interest rate or the uh, percentage, rather, that the executor can charge reduces or goes lower. Um, going back to the slide, uh, nursing home and Medicaid issues. So. Something to keep in mind with the estate planning is your long-term care planning needs and goals. So if the parent ends up uh, in a nursing home on Medicaid, and Medicaid is the government uh, program where the government pays for your long-term care needs, meaning nursing home care needs, uh, should you require nursing home care. and that happens when uh, you run out of money. And so if you get into a situation where you enter a nursing home and you are paying privately, meaning that you're paying the nursing home care costs on your own and you run out of money, then you would have to do a Medicaid application to continue paying the nursing home for your care. So, if a parent ends up in a nursing home on Medicaid, there are issues to consider with joint ownership of real estate. Uh, the home is generally considered an exempt asset in determining if parent qualifies for Medicaid. And Medicaid will have a lien on the, on the house uh, for the amount that 
is covered or the state pays the nursing home in Medicaid costs. So if the state paid Medicaid costs of $100,000, the state could have a lien for $100,000 on your home when you pass away. If the parent owns the house at the time of death, then the lien can be satisfied from the proceeds of the sale of the house. And that's if the parent owns the house individually by, their, by themselves. If the home is jointly owned with a child at the time the parent applies for Medicaid, and that's important. So keep in mind, the home is owned by the parent and the child at the time the parent applies for Medicaid. And also that home was owned for five years or more. Then the, uh, the, the house would not be uh, an asset that the state would be able to put a lien on to recover the $100,000 that they paid in Medicaid costs for the parent. So that house would be considered an exempt asset. So that's something else to consider um, when you're planning uh, to put someone on your house, a child um, or someone else. <clears throat> So planning with life insurance, uh, as I mentioned, life insurance is exempt in Pennsylvania. So what you want to think about is for people that are in that higher uh, inheritance tax rate. So remember, we were talking about friends early on in the slide, that 15% inheritance tax that you would pay or your estate would pay for money that is, that is uh, left for friends. Rather than leave them money or money from your account, if you have life insurance, you can identify them as a beneficiary and they would not, the estate would not have to pay any inheritance taxes on that distribution because they're getting the, the uh, life insurance, which is a non-taxable uh, transfer or gift in Pennsylvania. If, um, when, if you're naming a spouse uh, as your beneficiary, you want to be careful uh, because you want to make sure that you're not taking an exempt asset such as life insurance and possibly making it into a taxable asset. And when I say that, remember, you know, the, the earlier conversation or the earlier statement I made. So when you make a transfer to your spouse, that transfer is tax-free. And so you're taking life insurance, you're making that uh, distribution to your spouse. It's tax-free. Now, what's going to happen when that spouse passes away? That life insurance proceeds, they may want it to go to your children that's gonna become a taxable event down the road. So a lot of the planning that we wanna do is early on. So instead of leaving that money to your spouse in the life insurance, you can leave it to your children. And if your children are, are, are minors or if you have concerns about how they'll spend the money, you can put the life insurance into a trust for the benefit of your children. And that way, the life insurance distribution to your children will be tax-free, and the other assets that you have, you can leave to your spouse, and because it's going to your spouse, it would be a 0% tax impact. So, <clears throat> the other planning strategy is with retirement accounts. Um, if the decedent is young, the retirement account may not be taxable. Pennsylvania rules is that if there would have been a significant penalty to the decedent had the retirement benefit been withdrawn during a lifetime of that decedent, it would not be taxable. So if the beneficiary is under 59 and a half years old at death, then his or her retirement account will not be taxable, regardless of who the beneficiary is. 
And that's something to keep in mind with uh, your planning strategy and goals with retirement accounts. The other situation to keep in mind is with a client uh, that if you're looking to give money to charity, the retirement asset to fund those gifts can have significant can ha have significant tax savings to your estate. Obviously, the charities do not pay taxes, and so leaving retirement accounts or a portion of your retirement account to charities would be a, a really good way of reducing your taxable impact on your estate. So let's go through a scenario. <clears throat> we have a house that's worth $200,000. Let's look at a number of your assets. You have cash of $200,000, house of $200,000, life insurance with $200,000, retirement accounts of $200,000. So your total estate assets are $800,000. So if your beneficiaries are, you're going to give $100,000 to the charity, $100,000 to your children, and the spouse takes the residue, which means the spouse takes everything else. If the spouse is the beneficiary of the retirement account and the children and spouse are equal beneficiaries of the life insurance and the house and cash are part of the estate, that leaves $100,000 to the charity and the balance goes to the spouse. Ultimately, your tax liability, your estate's tax liability would be $0. Because now what you've done is you've maximized all of the uh, tax-exempt beneficiaries and all of the tax-exempt resources and paired it up in a way that leaves you with zero dollars in tax liability. But if you were to make any alteration to that $800,000, and let's say you took uh, a portion of that $200,000 in cash and left $100,000 to your child, you would then start to incur uh, inheritance taxes at the 4.5% level, which would be $4,500 to the child. So I have a question, what if children are beneficiaries of the IRA account? <clears throat> so again, if, it's, uh, if you're under 59 and a half years old uh, and, and that money is going to the child, that money would be tax exempt. If you're over 59 and a half years old, the amount that is going to the child would be taxed at the 4.5% level. So if you're over 59 and a half years old, you want to think about leaving that money to a charity or leaving it to your spouse so that the tax implication to that beneficiary would be zero dollars. Uh, another important uh, planning technique is uh, domicile planning. So when we talk about domicile planning, uh, your domicile or place where you are the resident is important <clears throat> because where you are domiciled uh, determines where you file and pay your inheritance taxes or your income taxes. It also determines um, where your decedent estate is going to um, be settled or handled. And so in a state like Pennsylvania, where there is inheritance taxes, you're going to obviously incur some inheritance taxes for distributions made to uh, anyone other than your spouse or a nonprofit or charity. If you look at other states, then a lot of people think about the warm climate, uh, like Florida, Texas. There are a number of other states that do not have state inheritance taxes. Florida is one of those places. So if you decide that you're going to move um, and you uh, end up residing in the state of Florida, uh, you, you can uh, avoid the inheritance taxes uh, once you've established 
uh, Florida as your domicile. And so that's another consideration to keep in mind. So when you're looking uh, to establish your, your domicile, you have to have been out of Pennsylvania for at least 183 days. Um, and so as long as you've been out of Pennsylvania for 183 days or more, you can establish domicile in another state. And it doesn't mean that you have to be in Florida for 183 days. So let's say 183 days includes a trip to Texas, and then you ultimately end up in Florida. But the fact that you've been out of uh, Pennsylvania for 183 days or more, you would avoid the uh, inheritance taxes in Pennsylvania. So I have a question. What about beneficiaries of Roth IRA? So it's a retirement account, <clears throat> and the implication with the retirement account is if, again, you're 50, under 59 and a half years old and you would have... Uh, made that transfer to the individual um, prior to you uh, becoming great, older than 59 and a half years old, it would be a non-taxable event. No, uh, so the question was, does it have to be 183 days of the last 365? It's a cumulative 183 days. Um, so as as long as your your time that you're out of Pennsylvania accumulates to 183 days or more, um, you would satisfy that requirement. Um, and also, you want to do other things to show that you have established residency in the other states, such as changing your driver's license, filing taxes, uh, local taxes with that new uh, location or state that you're living in. Um, also changing over your voter registration and also your passport and things of that nature. Everything that you can do to show that you now reside in another state. Looking at uh, taxation of trust, uh, we talked a little bit about trust. Um, when a trust is a beneficiary of an estate, there is an issue as to the rate of tax that applies to the asset going into the trust. So if your child is the beneficiary in the trust, that's what the Department of Revenue is going to look at to determine what the tax rate for that trust is. And let me see, I have a question here. Could you clarify the retirement account issue again? I'm sure my attorney said if children were beneficiaries, there would be no tax or IRA on a on IRA, but you are saying that there is. Only if they're only if they're fifty nine and a half years old, there would be. Please clarify again. Let me ask just Yeah, so if at the time of death the individual is fifty nine and a half uh, years older than 59 and a half years old, that would be uh, a taxable event um, to the beneficiary. So what, what matters is the age of the individual at the time of death, and uh, that's going to be a determining factor to make sure uh, or clarify what the taxable event is going to be, and also what beneficiary it's going to be. So if it's a child and you're over 59 and a half years old, that tax implication is going to be the 4.5% impact to the child. For, yeah, we're, we're talking about Pennsylvania, just to, to be clear. Um, so if we have beneficiaries with different tax rates um, for a trust, what is going to have to happen is there's going to have to be uh, something what's called a compromise. And, and so based on you can have a child, you can have um, a cousin or a friend listed as a beneficiary in that trust. And so because there are different inheritance tax rates, 
for those beneficiaries, what you would have to do is uh, create a compromise on what the tax rate would be. And, and so let's look at an example. Um, if a parent leaves an estate in trust for their children until they reach the age of 25, at which time the trust is paid out to the children, the rate of the lineal descendants would be 4.5% on the inheritance taxes. That's what would apply. Now, what if the trust says that if my child dies before reaching the age of 25, the remaining assets go to my brother and the brother would pay uh, a 12% uh, inheritance tax. So in that particular scenario, um, you would have to look at a compromise. And typically, in, we're looking at, uh, let's say that the money is paying for their college tuition, and there's $100,000 that is left for the children. And so the children are 19 years old, and the money and the average cost of uh, college for each year is $50,000. So there's a safe bet that we can say that that $100,000 is going to be used up pretty quickly um, in a couple years and that your brother isn't going to see any money. And there's a good chance that your children will, you know, spend that money before they reach the age of 25. So the compromise would be that that particular tax implication for that distribution in the trust would be at the 4%, 4.5% interest rate, as opposed to considering that 12% to your sibling, your brother. Looking at sole use trusts, um, sole use trusts are basically uh, trust for the sole purpose and benefit of the spouse. So if you set up a sole use uh, trust for the spouse during your spouse's lifetime, you can choose to either defer the tax until the spouse dies or you can file a compromise for the trust. And this is something that you can either have an accountant or your attorney do in terms of filing this compromise. And it really what it is is a uh, paperwork that's filed with the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue to uh, make a distinction on what the taxes are going to be for that particular distribution. And so with the sole use trust, um, the circumstances when you might file a compromise and pay the tax on a sole use trust in the estate, and that's the estate um, from the first spouse to die, uh, leaving it to their surviving spouse. So where you would file and, and pay that tax immediately is if the surviving spouse is in poor health and needs access to the money right away to pay for medical costs. Uh, that spouse would need that money uh, right away, and so you would file paperwork with the Department of Revenue to pay uh, taxes on, um, on that money immediately. If the assets of the trust are expected to appreciate faster than the rate of um, that's actually assumed, so if you know, the investments are doing pretty well and uh, the, uh, the taxes, it, it wouldn't make sense to pay taxes later on because you would have a greater estate. You may want to file a compromise to pay taxes on the estate currently rather than doing so down the road. And Looking at the other option in terms of 
circumstances when you might want to elect to defer the taxes on the sole use trust in the first estate is if the spouse is in good health and the spouse doesn't need that money right away. And if the assets are depreciating, uh, it's going to pose some benefits to uh, paying taxes on the estate um, at the time of uh, that spouse's death. Um, and also, if the spouse is likely to spend down the assets, you'll want to, uh, you know, have the, have the spouse's estate pay for those taxes at the time of that spouse's death. So the purposes and, and the needs of the spouse and the health of the spouse are important considerations to keep in mind and also to look at when you're looking at the sole use trust. And we have a question. Does PA tax gift transfers if made over one year before death? So Pennsylvania uh, does not uh, individually or separately uh, tax any gifts made over one year before death. So the next question is, spouse dies without will, husband and two children are over 21. Does husband get $30,000 and then estate split 50%? Okay, so that's uh, getting back to the intestate law. So part of the intestate law is that if there is uh, a child or children that are um, from birth of both spouses and there is no will and one spouse dies, the uh, surviving spouse does get the first $30,000, uh, and that's statutory. And the remaining uh, assets, uh, the assets that remain after that $30,000 are split 50% between the spouse and the surviving children. So that is an accurate statement. So that is it for me. And I think we have a couple more minutes for any other questions that people may have. Well, we'll wait for the questions to come in. And in the meantime, I'd just like to thank you, Nigo. Thank you very much. That was a lot of great information on a very complicated topic. Um, because you'll probably need it, you'll be receiving a recording of this presentation within 48 hours. Um, and then you might want to go over this again, just if there's anything that you missed, because there's a lot of um, it was jam packed with information. Um, and once you leave today's webinar, you're going to receive a survey. And we'd really appreciate it if you would fill it out. It would just take you a few minutes, um, it's like two seconds, actually. It's only like four multiple choice questions. Um, just we're just trying to make sure that the direction of the webinars is going the way that you want. Um, so, and also wanted to let you know that we also have a webinar next Tuesday um, at 11 a.m. and it's called Grieving Through the Golden Years. So we're going to have a grief counselor, and she's going to talk about um, how. Um, we have losses accumulate throughout life, not only of people, but also of employment, of bodily functions, you know, of all sorts of things. And she's just going to talk about how we deal with that. Um, and we also, the next webinar after that was going to be on October 5th, and it's going to be called um, Fitness and Durability at Every Age. And we're going to have a chiropractor who is going to actually demonstrate on the screen some um, way to move functionally so when you do, do everyday basic movements um, you stay healthy and you keep your keep your body as healthy as possible. So that's going to be October 5th from 11 to noon and you'll be receiving a brochure with that shortly after Labor Day. So it um, looks like, I'm sorry, it looks like we have one more question before I'm going to let you go. Okay, there's two questions. Okay, so uh, it looks like it's a statement or a question here. Your strategy seems to be move out of Pennsylvania <laughs> to put things in joint ownership. Um, each, I, I want to make it clear that uh, this uh, 
webinar um, is is not really to provide uh, specific legal advice or or to give general legal advice to everyone that's listening. Each individual situation is going to be unique, and so we have to look at what your objectives are, what you're looking to do, what your uh, assets look like, your beneficiaries, and then from there we can start to talk about different strategies that would apply to you specifically and individually. But what this uh, was supposed to do is to kind of give you an insight into some topics to discuss with your attorney, your accountant, when you meet with them. And, you know, you can go into that discussion from a point of edu ed being educated and then really have a two-way conversation with that professional as opposed to having a one-way conversation or one-way um, uh, directive from the individual. And and that lets them know that you are knowledgeable and and it also makes sure that if they're not giving you the proper advice, that you can seek out the person that can give you the proper advice. So, yeah, you know, moving, you know, other states that have no inheritance taxes and and looking at joint ownership, that's two of, you know, many different strategies that you can look at. Uh, the next question, unclaimed property, when is inheritance paid, inheritance taxes paid. Uh, so for unclaimed property, that is, once once it's been identified and, you know, the beneficiary has been identified, uh, if inheritance taxes were filed with Pennsylvania Department of Revenue, and let me just back up. So when, when I handle an estate, one of the things I do, the first things I do is I do a search for unclaimed property, just so that we can cover and, and take, bring in all of the assets into the estate so that we know that we, you know, have all of the property and assets covered and we can then properly uh, identify the tax rate and tax levels that we need to pay to the, the Department of Revenue. Well, let's say you didn't go to an attorney and you did this on your own and somewhere down the line you figured out that there was someone claimed property. And if there is no will, that unclaimed property will be distributed based on statutory provision. And so depending on who that property is going to be distributed to, could mean that there will be a tax or not. If it's going to be distributed to a spouse, there wouldn't be any tax. If it's going to be distributed to a child, then there would be a 4.5% tax paid on that unclaimed property. And then you would file an amendment to the inheritance return reflecting that because the state wants their money. And and so you want to make sure you dot the I's, cross the T's, and, and do everything of that sort. And the other important thing to remember with inheritance taxes is that you have nine months from the date of death to file your inheritance taxes. And if the inheritance taxes are not filed within nine months, you can request an extension up to an additional six months, uh, giving you a total of 15 months, which is a year and three months, to file the inheritance taxes with a request for an extension. If you go over the time frame allotted to you, then you end up having to pay penalty um, a penalty for each day you're you're going over in filing the inheritance taxes. All right. Uh, thanks for the comment, uh, Rick. Uh, thank you. Enjoy the presentation. I, I hope um, everyone was able to um, take some information away from this. And uh, you know, my contact information is is on the slide right now. So if you have questions, you can follow up with me. And you know I can uh, answer those questions because I'm sure you know after we leave here you'll have some additional questions and um, you know I just want to make sure that those questions will be answered. Nico, thank you very very much. That was a really informative presentation and um, very very interesting. 
So thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you at a future Bigger Wellness webinar. Have a great day. Thank you.